Next up is James T. Fulton on the origins of visual snow. James? I think I'm just going to walk over there. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak a little bit more on the physiology side of visual snow, what we know about it and what we don't. I'm interested in knowing how many of the people in the audience uh, feel they have visual snow themselves. Okay. How many of you are graduate students or senior levels in university? Okay, there's a few. Okay. Uh, in case you can't read the top line, for the students and others that have their uh, PCs with them, you can go to my website and uh, follow along, because some of these are going to have more detail in them than you really want. I'm not going to go through it. It's mostly a matter of trying to convince you that I've been working pretty hard on this problem. <laughs> and if you go to the website, uh, you may want to push the tab up in the top view and then notes page and you will have the text of more or less what I'm going to say, probably expanded a bit. Thank you. Uh, this is my second career. I've spent 25 to 30 years in the aerospace business working basically on visual sensors, both cameras, periscopes on submarines, telescopes for looking out at the Hubble world, etc. Uh, so far, I've published books on uh, bio biology of vision, uh, a similar book on hearing, and I've got a lot of material on the web on taste and smell. So my interests are in all the sensory uh, organs of the, uh, really the biological body, but the human body is the principal interest. I'm going to try and hit several subjects here, including terminology, which is a big problem, uh, particularly when there's no common organization that's really been following visual snow. Uh, you read all kinds of academic papers, and they use different names for different things, and that's really pretty awkward. And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, survey that I ran back in 2013 and received about 150 responses trying to get our arms around visual snow. And then I'm going to talk briefly about a new survey that will be on my website and possibly on the, the conference website as well on visual snow that focuses a little bit more on what I learned from the first survey. And then we'll talk about conclusions and moving ahead. Okay, there's my history. I sort of hit briefly. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. What I've done is broken the brain circuit, the visual modality total, into six or seven different sections. And then, then talked about section zero, which is the physical optics. Section one is the sensors, the retina. Two is our additional data processing in the retina, but have separate from the photoreceptors. And then it goes all the way up to cognition in the forward part of the brain. And then what we actually see is a response. We either see a muscular response, a kind of response, or some words spoken, which are muscular in nature. OK, here's the big thing I want to point out is some people have visual snow and some people have other symptoms that really fall in the category of a syndrome. Uh, as you see on there, I've listed just a few. Uh, floaters, blue sky phenomena, and blood corpuscles in the retina of the eye. These all affect the stage zero. They don't have anything to do with visual snow. They're separate items separate items uh, physically. Down at the bottom is the start of this visual snow, and some people see uh, machine gun bullets going across this, their field of view. Some people see what we typically call TV-type noise. Most of you in this room, 
uh, not maybe most, but about a third, have never seen visual snow on a television because they went away with the analog television sets that we used to have. <laughs> so the name is sort of left over from that world. These are the ones that are not visual snow, uh, and these won't show up at very good contrast with the amount of light in this room. But uh, the solid black dot you see up at the top is actually a question of blood leakage into the ocular or the inside of the eye. It has nothing to do with visual snow. Uh, most of that occurs in older people, over 40, over 50, uh, very seldom in younger people. The squiggly dots more or less in the middle of the screen uh, that really are rapidly moving around. They look like uh, almost birds, more than worms. Uh, those are really white blood corpuscles moving through the retina, part of your vascular system. They are not parts of visual snow either. Uh, and then, it would be very hard to see in this one, but in the lower part of the figure here, right in this area, you see some sort of outlines. These are actually dirt on the front of your lens. <laughs> People don't realize in our modern society how much dust you can have dissolved or attached to the outside of your eye. And these are actually Fourier transforms, if anybody wants to get technical. Uh, so they're very far out of focus. They're not in focus at all. Uh, so we'll hit that. Uh, that's probably all I'll say on that score. Yes, this is a blow up. Uh, and it shows the white corpuscles. Now the color here is for show purposes in the literature. It really doesn't, they don't appear that high of contrast by any means. And the interesting thing I want to point out is the circle in the middle of the figure, uh, which doesn't seem to have any white corpuscles in it. And that's true. The central part of the eye has a very small area, about one and a half degrees in diameter, 1.2 degrees, that doesn't have any blood vessels in it. It depends entirely on uh, filtration through the solid part of the eye. If you want to call it the solid part. This is the uh, diagram that I'm going to show just briefly to let you know what we're going on to. But the but more important one is this one, where the A and the B show the different halves of your retina for an individual eye. So you have a left field and a right field. I just label them A and B. These is their pass back to the brain. It's three separate paths. And each of the paths, the two upper ones, are split in half. So you have four different sectors, quadrants if you will, plus the central quadrant. And we're going to talk about those. Uh, this is one the slide with the numbers on. There's an area right down here that I particularly want you to be aware of that we see a lot of commonality between tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on who you, where, went, where you went to school, and visual snow. And it's suggesting, and we don't know this for sure yet, that there's a common element possibly a voltage source that is contributing to both tinnitus and visual snow. Most people with visual snow uh, will report tinnitus, probably 80%. It's a pretty large number. Uh, the, the real key of this one is followed by this next one here that shows these quadrants that I numbered in the previous one and then the center circle here, number five. If you see a uniform noise across your visual field, it's not due to one of these numbered quadrants. It's due to the whole system. And that's why we say it has nothing or very little to do with the forward part of the brain. It's backward, back farther into the brain. Probably in the thalamus, or possibly in what's called the associative area, 
which I generally call the saliency map, because that's where the brain puts together its version of what you see and says to the cognitive part, the prefrontal lobe, uh, this is what the real world looks like. Sometimes it doesn't look that way at all. <laughs> but that's a key. If you see noise all the way across, uh, that's, that's a key. Now, the previous survey I took was a small group from a statistical point of view. Uh, and so these numbers are very rough, and I hope to do a better job on this 2018 survey. But about 3% of the people that responded uh, had a genetic, uh, they had the symptoms at birth. Now, there's no known way to evaluate uh, having visual snow at birth, but reasonably around the age of five or six or seven, the child is talking to its mother, and the mother is saying, do you see the shiny car outside the window or the solid wall painted dark shiny blue, and the child says, well, I don't see anything shiny about it. I see a, almost a furry, like this sweater, you know, and that's, uh, that's when it first surfaces as visual snow to most genetically inclined people. Roughly 30% showed up to have an age of 30, 18 to 30 years, and about 30% had been used in recreational drugs. Uh, frequently the problem comes on after some sort of drug, whether it's prescribed or recreational, uh, about two to three weeks after the, the uh, drugs are absorbed. We also saw a strong tendency among roughly 10% of the people that, that found the visual snow very distracting to the point that some of them actually pulled out of college because they couldn't read well enough and it was just too much of a workload to try and uh, live with that. So that, uh, that's definitely a problem that we uh, need to try and understand more. Okay, here was my latest case, and this was interesting because Sierra and group was already starting to, to sponsor this conference and I got a call from a man in South Carolina, I believe it was, and he says his seven-year-old daughter just came down with visual snow uh, and they couldn't find out why. Uh, she had taken amoxicillin uh, a week or two earlier, but that's not a very strong medicine. It's pretty much the common one your dentist uses to uh, anesthetize your jaw when you're trying to do things. So we're not, we don't really expect that to be the problem unless she took a major amount too much. And that's also possible. This young lady uh, does have snow in the full field. It seems to be of the popcorn type, and I'll define that in a moment. And it seems to show some color to it. Now that's uncommon. We only saw maybe five or ten percent of the people even mention colored snow. Predominantly, it's a, a black and white. Again, it's sort of an acronym. It's more of a translucent pattern. Uh, people speak of it as black and white because it, of the old TV sets in black and white. <laughs> uh, and her symptoms were an interesting one. And this is why you had to be very careful talking to these people. She says the snow disappears when she's watching television. Well, the difference is, one case she's looking at a blank wall with no detail in it, and then she looks at the TV, in particular, say, outside the window here with the trees and all things. The snow is not as obvious when you have a complex scene. This is what I want to take a moment on because you won't see this in any textbook. This area that I'm going to sketch right here with just my finger is an area that does not appear in any textbooks. For some reason, the textbook people and the academics of the last century, the 1900s, didn't recognize that there's a piece of the thalamus 
that's at least as important as the visual, prim <laughs> quote, primary visual cortex. I try and leave the primary off because it's not primary in my uh, estimation. Uh, it's important and it's numbers one through four, but the one and the five is through this lower pathway that I showed earlier that it has nothing to do with the rear of the brain. And you'll see a lot of doctors in that talk about where your visual cortex is, the back of the brain. But the real high resolution part of your field of view, that little circle that I drew earlier, is not at the back of the brain, it's in the center of the brain. And that's very hard to get to. But watch for a change in uh, textbooks in the next five years in that area. This is sort of background material here and seeing where we're going forward. And as indicated briefly, this disease is usually not progressive. Once you have it for a period of a week or two, you're likely to have it for another 30, 40, 50 years without a significant change unless we can find out the reason and come up with a cure. And that's what the main focus on this meeting is. Uh, I'm going to get off of here and let you go ahead with the rest of the speech. Uh, my website is siteresearch.net. Uh, it's got a great deal of material on it, uh, particularly section 18.5. And thank you very much for your attention.